by Kashmir also wrote me what I was doing in Barcelona, uh, of mm-hmm. course. When I came here, I said that I want to win titles with Berlin. You know, I came from the best period in my life to uh, the darkest period in my life afterwards. Ball across to Dylan, now he double in flight! Oh, what a start! Woo! Yeah. Into the net. He does it again! Yes! A Meisterberg on the champion of Europe! And it is time to talk handball again, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you back. It is early in the morning on Monday when we're recording, but uh, everything uh, needs to be uh, done possible. Everything needs to be made possible for the IHF World Player of the Year, for Matthias Gitzel here, for uh, the, the best right back maybe that is living on the planet right now. And I'm not talking about the guy on my left hand side. Victor Thomas, how's it going? <laughs> everything good. Everything good. Yeah, I was about to say the best uh, right back with my permission because as you know i was a very uh, underused uh, right back uh, in Would my we career. have been talking about the greatest right back of all times <laughs> we uh, with uh, 10 more centimeters who knows you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh, fair on that fair on that uh, compa- comparing your skills as a right back to matthias gitzel's skills as a right back where would you rate yourself there uh, I would say around uh, one or two out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, uh, I would be a clear minus four out of ten uh, comparing yeah, yeah. to Matthias Gitzel. But I mean, uh, it's actually an honor that he is with us today because uh, he's such a great player. And it's great that he uh, makes himself some time to join us here um, because, uh, well, uh, there are some topics for him and for the Fuchs of Berlin uh, that are uh, just around the corner. So the championship is super tight in Germany. Uh, they are currently on the first uh, spot, but uh, Magdeburg is just behind them uh, with one point less, but one game less as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the championship couldn't be tighter at this point. Um, and on the other hand, uh, they are still in the race to go to Hamburg again. They are in the race to uh, go for the EHF finals, where you guys out there can still get tickets actually so uh, it's the 25th and 26th of may where uh, the ehf finals are being played the semi-finals and the final of the ehf european league um and fix berlin they are title holders uh, how do you see the stakes of the foxes uh, defending their title uh i think they are favorites but right now they they put themselves in a very difficult position when they lost both games in the group phase against sporting which yeah, was, was the main uh, round yeah yeah, uh, yeah in the main round sorry yeah which was um uh, completely deserved for sporting because i think they played an amazing two games against fox uh but now fox is in a very difficult situation because they don't have the home advantage against a very very a strong uh, Nantes team um, and Nantes they just beat Paris uh, yesterday mm-hmm. and they will be uh, full of confidence uh, for for this uh, playoff so I think they are favorites but these quarterfinals are really really tricky for them and I think if there is one team that can beat them in a double uh, game that's Nantes yeah, well, Nantes or Sporting, and uh, both of them are still in the competition. Um, and uh, Sporting has the Rhein-Neckar Löwen ahead of them, and uh, they are willing to go to Hamburg again. But as you see, uh, Rhein-Neckar Löwen, Füchse Berlin, uh, those are two German teams already, but they're still Flensburg as well. So uh, we might be looking at the three-way German side in, uh, in Hamburg at the end of May, but uh, maybe uh, we don't see any Germans there because... Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't see Löwen, uh, the Rhein-Neckar Löwen, in the, f- the role of the favorites uh, in the matchup against Sporting. Do you? Uh, I agree. I agree with you. I think that at this moment, Sporting are the, the favorites. Uh, the momentum they are living also in the Portuguese league um, and the, in the competition, it's, it's amazing. And I think they have found uh, the way they love to play which is a very fast handball, very young, I would say, mm. with, uh, of course, the Costa brothers. But uh, Nathan Suarez, for me, it's a key player for uh, for this team. 
And I think that right now, Sporting, in my opinion, it's the favorite against René Kalogan. Uh, let's just talk about all the matchups there, um, because I do agree that the, the Rhein-Neckar Löwen uh, are the, in the clear underdog role. I think they're just uh, in 11th spot in the Bundesliga this year, so things are not going as planned in the last season of Uwe Gensheimer, um, but uh, he's yet to return, um, and he will surely make a difference in that matchup. We can uh, absolutely bet on that, but... Uh, Yeah, when we're looking at the other matchups, we see uh, Skjern against Dinamo Bucharesti, uh, who's having his nose ahead there. I think Dinamo. I think Dinamo. I, I think Dinamo will go through. Um, but actually, uh, I think that Skjern has the power to to um, to beat Dinamo, especially for the home advantage that they have. Uh, but I think, and in my opinion, uh, Dinamo is, is ahead. I think uh, Skjern really, really depends to have a, a okay result in the first game in, in, in Romania. Uh, if they have less than three, four goals disadvantage, maybe they can do it. But in my opinion, Dinamo is the favorite. Yeah, I uh, do agree there. Uh, Dinamo Bucharesti uh, looking strong as well throughout the season, uh, as well as Flensburg. And I would say that this could end up being the clearest matchup, Savahov against Flensburg. Yeah, I think that if we look at the names of the teams, maybe it looks like that. But mm. I also thought that Hannover was uh, a favorite against mm. uh, um, uh, Savehov. So <sighs> Savehov has nothing to lose. They don't have pressure for this playoff. Uh, they will enjoy. They will uh, play their handball, which is really fast, and they can just uh, score three, four goals in, in two minutes. Uh, and that's dangerous for, for Flensburg. If they go to Sweden and they don't play a good first game, uh, it's gonna it's going to be problematic for them. But how well do you think uh, Flensburg is knowing Savov? Because uh, while they do have their Danish access with the coach and with all the, the Danish players that they have in their roster, um, but does that Scandinavic combination that they have in their roster help uh, playing against a Swedish team like Savov? Uh, I'm not sure if the, 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 um, all the Scandinavian players playing in Flensburg that helps or not. I think that Uh, the the staff of Flensburg will prepare really well that that game. They will study Sabehov uh, because Sabehov they made a statement uh, mm -hmm. kicking out Hannover from the competition uh, the way they did it, which was yeah. quite um, I wouldn't say easy uh, because sometimes it's difficult to find the words in English, but I would say quite comfortably. Yeah, uh, they did it. So I think that Flensburg at this moment, uh, it's uh, really um, careful with this uh, playoff because they know what Sabehov uh, can do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, then we are looking at the last matchup that we haven't talked about yet. But uh, for today and for today's podcast episode, the most interesting matchup, because we are looking at the Füchse Berlin against the HBC Nantes. And uh, that's one that I'm looking forward to pretty much because we are seeing the current title holders. But on the other hand, we are actually uh, seeing a team who throughout the entire season has never scored less than 30 goals. And, uh, I mean, that could be something that, uh, uh, yeah, well, the Füchse Berlin uh, would be preparing for. So uh, how is it possible to stop this Nantes offense? Honestly, for me, uh, alongside with Dynamo, this, can be, this was the final that I was expecting for this competition. Nantes uh, against Füchse? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, and now we are going to see this uh, playoff between them. So it's going to be an exciting double game. Um, it's difficult to, to stop this attack because they have a lot of players uh, in, in different positions that can play in a different way. For example, they have Julian Boss and Jorge Maqueda in the right back, and they are very different players. Uh, but they also have Thibaut Brie and Cavalcanti, mm. which... They are good shooters, both of them, but they are a little different. 
Uh, they have uh, the La Bretesha and Aymeric Min, which are also different in my opinion. So uh, I think that this Nantes team, they have a lot of uh, potential and and different ways to, to attack, uh, which can be difficult to, to analyze for a defense uh, for, uh, for Berlin. Yeah, and uh, we are going to have a look at how they are going to approach it with the guy that will just join us right now because uh, he is all-star. He became MVP in all his tournaments. Uh, not in all his tournaments, but in many tournaments that he played. He's the joint top scorer of the EHF Euro 2024. Mr. IHF World Player of the Year, Matthias Gitzel. How's it going? It's going good. Just finished the first uh morning training and now uh, just a couple hours free before the next train. So right now it's feeling good. Oh, actually, so uh, I can just tell uh, whilst we are recording, it's 11.30 in the morning. Uh, I would not have expected you to have your, had your first training yet. I'm on the morning in Fuxi Berlin. It's not uh, always a pleasure, but uh, today was like that. And the uh, lucky thing is now we have a little bit of time to have a little sleep over the next couple hours before the next training. So, yeah, but Monday <laughs> morning is a little bit, it's a little bit tough. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, on the other side, uh, we are joined here not just by Matthias Gitzel, but uh, by probably one of the best right wings of all time. You have played on the right wing uh, once or twice as well throughout your career. To compare your right back skills would be a little unfair, but who's the better right wing? <laughs> as I have, to, I have to say, I don't, I don't hope you can see it on me that I'm a little bit starstruck of Nico Thomas is joining out here today. Uh, because that was always one of my favorite wings when I was a little bit younger and I was right wing. Uh, and I only had one shot that was uh, shooting short uh, and that was a little bit too too simple in the end as being a right wing at the top level. But, uh, but of course, Victor Thomas is one of the, the biggest legends on, on the wing. So I'm, I'm going to give that to Tom Victor Thomas. Agree? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, uh, before you, uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here, Matthias. It's a real pleasure that you take the time to, to be here with us. Uh, I compared my uh, right, we, right back skills with you. Uh, so uh, for me, it was one and two out of 10 if I compare uh, with you. <laughs> But I, I always say to Bengt that I was a heavily underused right back in my career because I have a soul of a right back, you know, in me. But uh, <laughs> no, I don't know why no coach uh, trusted me in the in the back position. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much Wait. for uh, for your words. Uh, but I think that this uh, short shoot in the in the wing, it's enough if you do it uh, well enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's actually one thing that I'm uh, interested in about as well, uh, because uh, Matthias, you actually just bought a uh, an apartment in Berlin and uh, you renovated it yourself. So, uh, how would you rate your craftsman skills? <laughs> After the process, I would say it's uh, it's also a low low uh, low result. <laughs> as a, I, you know, uh, I always like to to do it by myself. I always wanted to be a, a Like a, a guy with uh, craftsmanship uh, doing the, you, yourself. As I was really little, uh, that was my dream. And then I became a little bit better to handball. That was a little bit more uh, funny to do. Uh, but I have to say, I tried to do it in the apartment, but I think the professionals are a little bit better than, than me. And I have to focus on handball now. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, it's been a fun, funny process. And now we're here, we can, we can live here and we can sleep here. And it's, uh, it's amazing. And I mean, having bought an apartment in Berlin, is uh, that a sign of commitment for the Füchse and for the city as well? Yeah, maybe also a sign that I need, need a place to sleep uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, there is, a, of course, always an investment aspect of having an apartment in a big city like Berlin. But also that the fact that I'm, we love to be here, uh, both me and my girlfriend uh, and the small friend, uh, him and our dog. We all, everyone like to be here, uh, and of course, it's also a commitment to, uh, in my thoughts that I'm going to stay here for a lot of years. Uh, I hope also Berlin want me to do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, your contract goes until 2028 right now, and uh, your dog has a German name, so uh, what more could you ask for as uh, yeah, a, a right back and as the Fuchs of Berlin? So uh, going on vacation in Barcelona is not a hidden sign. <laughs> no, actually, my uh, my cash also wrote me what I was doing in Barcelona. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, uh, Barcelona has the maybe the best, and uh, is the best handball club in the world, the biggest. 
uh, but it's also an amazing vacation destination. And, and, and I can also go on vacation without it has to be assigned every time. Uh, so that was just pure vacation. Looking to my left, you I, can probably agree. I already like it, this guy, but I like him uh, much more right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, but uh, let's uh, keep it here uh, just as the topic that we have been talking about uh, just when you joined. Uh, we've been talking about your upcoming uh, European League matchup in the uh, EHF European League. Um, you know how it feels lifting the EuroLeague trophy uh, how are, how big are those ambitions to defend your title and uh, win it for the fourth uh, for the fourth time uh, for berlin yeah of course it's uh, always important to win titles uh, and when i came here i said that i want to win titles with berlin uh, not something uh, people were used to that uh, we in berlin uh, wins titles and we started in the first league to win european league hopefully next year we're going to play uh, play the champions league uh, but yeah Standing in front of uh, Nantes is a little bit our own fault. Uh, losing to an amazing sporting team uh, was uh, played a completely amazing two, ga two games against us. We had uh, almost no chance to beat them. Uh, but now we're standing here in the quarterfinals against Nantes, uh, maybe the best team in the tournament. So that's going to be a, a big challenge uh, and maybe can be the, the end for us. But we also know that we have the quality. Uh, we just have to figure out how we combined uh, playing uh, a top level against uh, Nantes two games. And also combine it with uh, playing against Kiel and Milsung uh, between uh, those games against Nard. Uh, so we're looking forward. But uh, yeah, it couldn't be a worse uh, uh, yeah, opponent uh, for us than, than Nard. Yeah, I, I, as I said to Wengt uh, earlier, for me, you put yourselves in a very dangerous situation because in my opinion, this was the final that I was expecting for this competition when the competition started. Would you also agree that this could be an advanced uh, final, but this time in a playoff, in a double game? Yeah, as a, in, in my honest opinion, I think this is two teams who belong to the, to the Champions League. Uh, and I think uh, it's two teams who, who is uh, the best teams in the European League. And, and like I told before, it was a dangerous position, like you said, for us. We put ourselves in, but it was because we were, we were in a dangerous period also in the Bundesliga, where we had to make sure between staying number one in the Bundesliga, but also compete against Sporting. And, and we, we, we wasn't good enough to that. And that's also why I say it's very dangerous. We're playing against Kiel. Then we go to, to the Nant game, playing against Melsung, and then the Nant again. Uh, and we have to, yeah, you know, we have to win everything when we want to become German champions also. And we want to be European League. It's a very really difficult balance. Uh, and, and yeah, now we're in this situation. We know we have the quality to beat Nant. But if I was not, I would also think that Fixie Berlin was a really uh, tough opponent to get in the quarterfinal. And I mean, um, yeah, go ahead. Now, uh, sorry, Ben. Now that you put on the table this balance between European League and Bundesliga, uh, I'm sure that you have heard uh, along the, the years that there is this belief uh, in, uh, in the other countries that German teams, they don't prioritize the European competitions and they prioritize the Bundesliga. Uh, and you uh, playing in, in Fuchs Berlin, who is playing for both titles, what would you say to, to these people on how the team is balancing these two competitions? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say because, of course, uh, for Fuchs Berlin team who has never won the German championship and right now is one point after Magdeburg is, is of course, number one goal. As so we're not going to lie about that. We want to win every title and so on. But it's also really difficult for German teams because we only have two Champions League spots. And for clubs like Kiel and Flensburg, Magdeburg, and now also Fuchs Berlin, it's Alpha Omega to play in the Champions League. Uh, so we have to be one or two in the Bundesliga between these teams. It's so hard. So sometimes when, when we have injuries or so on, you have a small uh, injury, then you have to say, okay, Gisel, you cannot play against Constanza in the European League because we have to prioritize the next Bundesliga game. So for our perspective, I can, I can see that people say that German teams doesn't care about the European League and, uh, and so on. But we, we, does, we, we do care. But we also just have to be one or two in the Bundesliga to play Champions League. And of course, Champions League is the biggest thing we can play. Uh, and it's just mm -hmm. so hard for German teams to come in Champions League. Uh, so sometimes we have to be really uh, cut those uh, uh, yeah, lines really hard and say uh, we're not going to play with the biggest stars against the lower teams in the European League. But when we are here, as of now we're in the quarterfinals against Nantes, 
we also, as a sportsman, I think you also know that, Victor, that as a sportsman, you really want to win every game now when you are in the quarterfinals and you're going to play again now. We're also going to show everyone else that the German teams are something difficult, different uh, to, mm-hmm. the, to the other teams, like Magdeburg showed last year in the Champions League. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it is the strongest league in the world. Uh, it's not just something we say for fun, and it's really hard to balance between European League uh, and, uh, and the Bundesliga. And I mean, uh, you have been talking about the schedule that is just coming up for you with Kiel and Melsing and the the uh, two matchups against Nantes. Um, would you wish for an easier schedule in between those Nantes games or are those exactly the matches that uh, you say, well, we can keep the focus high, we need to uh, give it our best each and every minute that we are on the court? Um, or do you say, well... Uh, would be cool to have uh, one or two games that are just from the names a little easier than uh, what is coming up. Yeah, maybe uh, can I answer your question after that the game said? I guess not. Uh, <laughs> of, of course, there is something uh, something uh, mentally that now we are in the final period. We have played amazing here this year in, in Berlin. As a, we have been with only four backup players and we are here having the chance to win every every yeah every titles. Uh, so, so we have played amazing, but now we're in the final period, uh, so now we also have to win titles, and not only have played a good season, uh, and and you just can't afford mistakes, and, and maybe that's also a good flow to be in as a player. Uh, now you know, if you want to be the best player, now you also have to turn the switch on and say, now you're going to uh, decide all the games uh, and, and win some titles. Now we have, uh, we're standing for uh, before the Pokal uh, tournament here in, here in, in this weekend, having the first t- the chance to win the the, this uh, first trophy, uh, but yeah, Kiel, Nantes, Melsung, Kiel, uh, 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 Nantes. Nantes. It's, yeah. it, sound, it sounds a little bit uh, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it, it does, actually does. It does actually. Um, but to be fair, you bounced back from the defeat against Magdeburg quite well. So uh, that matchup was like th- uh, three weeks ago, I think. Um, but then uh, after that, you uh, didn't lose a single point. Still, you don't have it in your own hands to uh, win the Bundesliga title for the rest of the season because uh, mm. right now you are one point ahead of Magdeburg, but they still have that game in hand. Um, and uh, yeah, what are your feelings towards the rest of the Bundesliga season? Whew, uh, it's tough. It's tough, man. Uh, you know, I always said that for me, is uh, Magdeburg the best team in the world? Uh, and and to beat them uh, is uh, is really hard. Uh, and of course, now it's out of our own hands. We can only focus on ourselves. Like I said, we also have a really difficult uh, program in front of us. Magdeburg also have some difficult games. They also have to to balance between this uh, Champions League now, uh, the qualifiers in Champions League, and staying clear in the Bundesliga. So for us, it's just focusing on staying just in the heels of Magdeburg, uh, not losing more points. I don't think we can afford more points, uh, more, more lost points. And then um, if Magdeburg make a mistake, then we are there. Uh, if Magdeburg doesn't make a mistake, then we also have to respect their, their performance this year. Uh, then they have uh, played amazing. Uh, so, But I'm just really proud of that we are there, Fixer Berlin. As a, who talked about Fixer Berlin for uh, some years ago uh, to become a German champions? Now we're one point behind Magdeburg. Uh, mm-hmm. I had, had a chance. And next year, we have a good distance for maybe coming in the Champions League. And then we're going to talk ne- Champions League next year. Also a big step for, for this club. So... We are we are in a really 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 good development in this club, and uh, I think in some years uh, we maybe we're gonna get the chance every year to win the German Championship. Maybe not this year, but for sure we're gonna come back next year again. Okay, now that we have been spoken about what's what's going on right now, uh, and uh, with Fuchs Berlin, I would like to go a little bit back on time uh, when he made his uh, debut with the Danish national team. Uh, at this point, you were. Uh, known player of course for the Danish humble fans uh, but you were not as known as a superstar as you are right now um, how did you process that change uh, in Denmark which all of us know it's a big humble country and and you guys are big stars uh, going on the restaurants on the streets on the games uh, a lot of fans are trying to get a picture or a signature from you guys. How did you leave this change when you went from being a okay known player to a superstar in Denmark? Was this a difficult mental process to, to go through? 
Yeah, so you know, I haven't, um, I have been really honest about the period after the first uh, World Cup in Egypt in 21. Uh, this uh, transition from no one to everyone, uh, you know, I, I became like everyone thought like I was one of the part of their life uh, when they saw me in, in, in these small cities in Denmark. And so on. And I was really honest how, how difficult it was mentally. Uh, it was, you know, I came from the best period in my life, uh, these three weeks in Egypt playing uh, handball I didn't knew I could uh, become all-star and also world champion with the team to uh, the darkest period in my life afterwards. Uh, yeah, maybe three days after I came home from Egypt, I was totally worn out mentally. I was um, I was sad in my own apartment. Uh, I caught maybe myself crying a little bit uh, because uh, this transition was too hard. I had no clue what uh, was awaiting me when I came home to Denmark. Uh, this new life, this everyone wants to get in contact with you. Uh, every clubs were calling you, could you go here, maybe this is better for you. And, and everyone was pulling you from left and right. And that was really, really hard for a 20 years old uh, guy like me. Uh, and that was one of the darkest periods in my life where I really have to work hard with a mental coach, trying to figure out uh, why I woke up every day. Uh, uh, and that's uh, trying to find, you know, the joy again. Uh, I thought maybe at that period, it was a little bit, I was more playing handball for someone else. Uh, all the media so pulling at me. Uh, and I really have to figure out why I was doing it. And, and that was the darkest period in my work life, my professional handball life, but also this period where I learned the most from, uh, you know, that also what have made me who I am now. Uh, I always saying when people ask me, how can it be you are playing so good? You know, it's just, it's just a game for me. I'm just having fun. And I also hope people can see that when I'm on, on the court, I'm just a small guy who loves playing with this small sticky ball. Uh, and having fun with it. Uh, and it, that period learned me that, that it's all about having fun and not playing handball or not doing something for someone else than you. And and that period after the Egypt, I think you also heard about it since you were asking these questions, that that it was the hardest period for me, uh, for Matthias as a person. And, and also this period I learned the most of. Uh, and I tried to talk with medias and try to talk open about it. Uh, also maybe some like Pütli just come two years later and had the same journey as me. Uh, maybe he could learn something about uh, my story. So yeah, that was really a hard to transition. And I mean, out of all these offers that you actually talked about, because uh, ever since you've been that world-class player, you've been that world star, um, even the best player in the world right now, uh, as you have just been crowned. Um, why was it Fuxa Berlin for you? And uh, why that commitment to Fuxa Berlin? Because of uh, the story I just told, because it was all about, uh, for me, uh, personally, development and feeling uh, that you are wanted, feeling that you are loved by by something just more than normally we are just a product for a, for a sports director or a club. We just something you pay amount of money and then you have to do like this, perform really good. But here in Berlin, it was a little bit more uh, also Matthias they looked at, uh, not only Matthias Gisland with number 19. Uh, so I really felt that I was wanted and I felt like I could be a part of a story. Uh, you know, uh, maybe that was a little bit naive uh, in the start to think that you could build up a Champions League team, a German Champions team. But in the last two years, I think we have proven every, everyone wrong who said uh, this club is not big enough or why are you taking to Berlin? Uh, they are number three or four in the Bundesliga. It doesn't matter. Now we are fighting every day about the Champions League uh, spot and the German Championship. And to be a player in that means so much because you, you have to work so hard every every day because you're not just going to be Spanish champion or French champion or German champion every uh, easy because you're playing in Barcelona or Paris or, or Kiel who was a record meister like they call themselves uh, uh, so you really have to work hard every day if you want to achieve something in this club because we are not the favorites uh, and I think that's really good for your personal development uh, as, a, as a human and as a handball player I think you have to work a little bit harder here than you maybe have to do in Magdeburg because they know they can play a little bit bad and then they're still going to win as we can't afford to play bad in, in Berlin and I think that also helps me as a handball player and a, as a person to become even better yeah. And now that you spoke about favorites and being the underdogs or, or, or favorites, 
uh, I would like to change a little bit to the national team in the last EHF Euro, where everybody was uh, considering you guys, which I thought you were the clear favorites to win. But uh, I always maintained that you and France were in the same level. Uh, but nine out of ten persons, if you would ask them, uh, they would say Denmark is going to win. Uh, what would you say to that people that it's giving you this uh, role of, of, of big favorites? And how do you deal with this role uh, being used to play with Fuchsebelin, which you have another role mentally uh, playing in the German uh, championship? Yeah, I would just say that we're humans. As a, we are not like robots who you can, uh, you can, we're not, you know, even though we want to win every tournament, even though we want to play 100% every time, then in the end, we're also just normal humans like uh, you guys. Uh, and we also make uh, mistakes. We also fail sometimes. And I know if it was a video game and we can turn everyone on 100% on the Danish team, then maybe we'll win nine out of 10 times. Uh, but this isn't a video game where, where we are like robots on 100% and we make mistakes uh, and mistakes will occur also in the final in Cologne when in front of 20,000 people. So in the end, it's so small marginals. You also know that for your career, it's so small things who decides a final uh, against French, the, against the French team, which are also really impressive. Uh, we don't sometimes forget how, how good the other teams also are and just sometimes just saying, oh, Denmark is so good. Yeah, we know that we have an amazing team. We know we have amazing, a lot of players in, in Denmark at the moment who are so good and we can have two, three teams at the, world, at the European League, uh, at the European tournaments and so on. But in the end, we can make mistakes as well, like everyone else making mistakes on our on, on their job. So uh, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's so hard to be the favorites, as I know people are talking about. But if you look at our squad, it's people who are who are always used to be the favorites in their own clubs and and playing for championship in every year, every year in every league, and playing also in Champions League. Uh, and we are really having Nico Jausens made this squad like a small family. So it's not something we are going talking about or we are feeling a pressure of failing or losing in in the Danish squad. We know we are really, really good, but we also have a humble uh, perspective on that. We also know that people are also uh, French team and Swedish team and so on are also training every day uh, to become better. Uh, and we know it's not uh, it's not easy to win every tournament. Uh, but I'm really proud of that. We're always there. We're always in the final weekend uh, and having the chance. And sometimes it's going post in, and sometimes it's going post out. And I wanted to ask you uh, about one of your teammates in the national team. I think um, um, it's fair to ask, uh, what, what what did it mean, Mikkel Hansen, for you in the national team now that he's going to retire and how the national team is, is going to feel about it and how he's facing these Olympic Games, uh, trying to win for him? Now that everybody was talking about Nikola Karabatic in the Euro and nobody was talking about Mikkel Hansen because we didn't know that he was going to retire. Mm -hmm. But now we know. Uh, how strong is going to be this decision of Mikkel uh, inside the Danish team to get you guys all together trying to win the Olympic Games for, for him? Yeah, you know, Miguel is number one in Danish handball uh, through the whole history. As a, by far number one, he has changed the whole uh, handball. Uh, you also said that handball is number one in, in Denmark now. It is because of Miguel. Um, Miguel has uh, changed the way all the young kids are going. Everyone is going with this headband now to, to the youth training in Denmark now. Uh, it's all because of Miguel. And of course, he had made a lot of things for, for Danish handball, for the Danish national team, but also for us young players. So one thing is that he is uh, by far uh, one of the best handball players in the world, but he's also learning so much to us young guys and, and giving us all those advices. And I, will, I will also see him as a friend. Uh, one thing is on the court, but also off the court. Uh, so, of course, it will mean a lot, of, a lot for the Danish people, for the Danish handball team, but also for us Danish national players to be there with Miguel in Paris uh, doing the Olympic Games. And, and hopefully we can... Ended with a game with against France and Kalabacic and Mikkel Hansen in in the final, and then um, then hopefully it's it's gonna end with Danish goal this time. Uh, but that would be one of the biggest uh, 
uh, clashes if I think they will end the career together in 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 the in the last uh, in the last uh, game in the Olympic Games. But of course, uh, for everyone, it will mean a lot to be uh, beside Mikkel when he ends his career. Uh, for all those young guys, he has been my idol. Uh, first first day at the national team, I want to carry his back because uh, I was uh, like uh, he was so big an idol for me. So uh, to stand beside him and end his career will, will definitely be something special. And I mean, that clash was the clash for uh, the Euro this year as well. And uh, just this Friday, the 12th of April, the EHF is uh, releasing a documentary uh, that you have been a part from as well. Um, and uh, I was told that you already watched that documentary that is uh, being released this Friday. Uh, how did it feel for you to uh, live through that Euro again and to uh, watch that documentary? No, of course it's not the uh, it's not clipped the, the final like I wanted to, uh, but uh, of course I think it's amazing for the handball that we have a, a video team following us and also for the expansion and the focus on handball that we have a documentary who shows also a little bit behind the scenes uh, that uh, about the handball tournament and also shows that we are also normal uh, families. Uh, we also see a lot of pictures of Kalabachis and, and his family. And I think it's really good to see that we also normal humans behind the the handball, uh, but sometimes people just forget it that we are like uh, some guys who are on the court only, and you can yell a lot of things of, on us and and write a lot of stupid things on social media about us, but this documentary also shows that we're just normal uh, normal humans also off the court. I think it's really really good uh, that uh, we have this documentary, and I think it's actually uh, it's it's really amazing. Even though that uh, is is France on 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 the one spot after after the documentary, but uh, I think it's amazing uh, off the behind the camera uh, documentary. Absolutely, it's uh, a, a great uh, cinematic masterpiece that is uh, being uh, was being filmed there, uh, and I uh, would highly recommend you guys to watch it. 12th of April uh, on the Home of Handball YouTube channel. Um, but uh, let's keep it at the Euro for a little bit uh, because you have been talking about those 20,000 people uh, screaming and shouting in the Lexus Arena, um, and uh, you guys have been on quite a journey uh, throughout the uh, the whole Euro as well. All in all, to put it in a nutshell, how would you rate your uh, Euro experience in Germany? Ooh, of course, we are a little bit uh, colored by losing the final. Uh, but if we have to look a little bit uh, beside that, I think it was the, the best tournament ever. Uh, I know I'm young. I haven't been in so many tournaments uh, like uh, Victor Thomas has. But... Uh, But I think uh, it was uh, as a one kind of uh, adventure. So we played in München, uh, the first group games, and that was so loud, uh, even though the German team wasn't there, and there was 12,000 spectators to the group stages. And uh, the atmosphere, of course, also going to Hamburg, there was a lot of Danish people in Hamburg. And then, of course, in the end, going to Cologne was, uh, yeah, the handball mecca in Cologne. Uh, it's it's something special. Uh, and. And I think the whole tournament was so well arranged, organized. And uh, yeah, I just think Germany is number one country in the world when it comes to handball and organi organizing all these tournaments. And uh, the culture and the people, are, yeah, they are crazy. And that's also why I love to play in the Bundesliga every every week because German people are crazy when they're entering a handball arena on a good way. <laughs> and I mean, uh, you did experience that, especially uh, on the Friday, I think it has to be, uh, because it was the semifinals day, um, and you guys were actually down by a goal, uh, at uh, no, by two at halftime. Um, how were the feelings in the locker room, and were you ever afraid to lose that game? I uh, wouldn't say we were afraid. We had a lot of respect for Germany on, on German soil. soil. We knew it's going to be really hard, and and if you watch that game, it was also maybe more wrestling than than handball at some point because of the arena was so 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 warm. Everyone was shouting, and the German player was also maybe get a little bit too excited. Uh, but we also knew that if you could maintain the level, uh, our own level, and playing with control and consistency over 60 minutes, then in the end we will be a better team. But I have to really have respect for that uh, atmosphere we we faced uh, in this semifinals against Germany. That was uh, that was uh, one of the hardest mentally uh, assignments we were we were over for this uh, European League, uh, European tournament. 
I only have European League and none in my head. You can, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's totally fair. Um, but yeah, to to keep it at that match there, um, you uh, came out of the break and uh, almost immediately started to run over Germany with a seven versus six. Um, in the first uh, half, I think Andy Wolf was quite a nightmare to you, wasn't he? Oh, he is quite a nightmare for a lot of people at the moment. But yeah, we, we talked about it in Lager Moon to use this seven against six just to calm a little bit German down. Uh, to get a little bit more control, play him a little bit more slowly, as normally we want to play fast, and 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 we had to take him a little, little bit more the aggressivity about Ella out of uh, Heyman and Gola and the Kohlbarger was just standing and beating Danish small guys, uh, and we have to play a little bit more structure with Miguel in the seven against six, and I think that calmed a little bit the, the game down and and made us a little bit a uh, little bit more easier uh, go, so we don't didn't have to fight with the, the Germans guys uh, the whole time. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Victor, you uh, have any questions left for the Euro? Uh, actually not. I think uh, we can let him go and rest a little bit before the second training of, of the day. Yeah. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to speak with you. I honestly have to say it's uh, it's fantastic to see you playing. Uh, uh, at least I speak for me. Uh, when I see you playing, I see you that you're enjoying for yourself, that you like Hamble, that you love Hamble. And the way you play, it's different of what we are used to. Uh, the the control you have of the timing, the tempo, the spaces, and the game, it's just amazing. And I just uh, want you to keep going because it's, it's fantastic to see you in the in the playing court. Thank you. Thank you. Before we let you go entirely, <laughs> I uh, need a hot take. I need a prediction from you. Uh, because in the EHF European League, there are still three German teams left. Uh, there are four tickets to be booked at the uh, EHF finals. Um, and in the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League, there are two German teams left fighting for uh, two of the four spots in the semifinals. Out of those five teams, how many German teams will actually manage to uh, go through to the semifinals? I think it's going to be a German season. Uh, I will say mm. four, four teams. Oh, four teams, actually. Uh, are you going to tell us mm. who's not going to make it? I will say that Kiel, Magdeburg, is going to go through the Champions League. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Flensburg is going to go through the European League. And and I will be stupid if I doesn't say uh, Fuse Blin will, will qualify against Nant. But it will be a really tough game in Nant that will be decided in the last second. But I really think Kiel and Magdeburg have some good chances in the Champions League. And yeah. uh, hopefully I'll also, we also see each other in the European League final all weekend. I uh, do think that the, the odds are not too bad here. And uh, to be fair, Reinecker Löwen, uh, as we said it ahead of uh, your interview here, um, are not the clear favorites against Sporting, uh, especially looking at their season in the Bundesliga there as well. Um, but yeah, I'll take it, the German season. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, sweet. Uh, then uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you for uh, having of been course. here with us. It has been a pleasure and uh, it has been an honor talking to you for uh, such a, a long period of time. Uh, best of luck for the rest of your season. Uh, best thank of you. luck for the Olympics and that all your hopes and dreams will uh, come true this season and, uh, and that you will stay healthy for as long as you can. Thank you. See you. Sweet. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. See you around. Good luck. Uh, a uh, great talk with him. Such a, a humble guy and uh, you can really feel his uh, his desire to j play for the joy of the game. Yeah, yeah. I really love to, to speak with him for, for this time uh, because sometimes people say about Matthias Gitzel that he's flopping sometimes, that um, yeah, he's not a tough player, but I think he's a really tough player. Yeah. He loves the contact, he loves the 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 pressure, and and he's dealing with that pressure in a very special way, uh, which is very difficult to see. And in my opinion, is uh, at this moment, of course, at, as he was crowned the EHF uh, best player in the world at 2023, but he is one of the best. And, and he will be one of the best uh, in, in humble history. Yeah, I do agree. Uh, if he uh, continues to play the way he does, if he continues to win the way he does, uh, then we will be talking about one of the best of all time on his position uh, very, very shortly. Because uh, if we look at his personal statistics and his personal career, each and every major tournament that he has played for the senior uh, Danish national team, he became either MVP 
All-Star or um, uh, top scorer of the tournament or two of those things combined. Uh, it's just insane how good Matthias Gitzel is. It's insane. It's insane. And we have to remember how many good players do we have in humble world at this moment at right back yeah. position yeah. because we have Alex Dutsevayev, we have Dika Mem, we have Melvin Richardson, we have, well, Nedim Remili is not uh, right back anymore as he yeah. is a center back. Uh, but we have a lot, a lot of good players. We have, um, yeah, Alvin Lagergren. We have a lot of good players in this. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you are right. I'm a yeah, underused right back. You're we right. had Victor Tomas. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's amazing how good he is. And also, I felt it was really um, charming what he explained to us about Fuchs Berlin and, and him signing this new deal and the first deal that, that, that took him to Fuchs Berlin to be part of something, to, to make a club grow, uh, yeah. to win the titles and to get this uh, spot in the Champions League again. Uh, it was very, very beautiful to hear and, and he is uh, succeeding in this uh, goal that he had when he signed for Fuchs Berlin. Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, what I appreciated a lot about him talking about his move to Fuchs Berlin is actually that he uh, went there to build up something, to uh, not go to the favorites, not go to the biggest of the, the biggest teams. And I mean, as we heard, he did have a lot of offers and uh, he didn't talk about names there, but you can just imagine how much... Uh, Yeah, how big those clubs have to be that uh, will ask for a superstar like him because uh, once that he returned from Egypt, he wasn't that small little guy uh, anymore and he wasn't that uh, unwritten piece of paper because, uh, well, just the way that he played, he uh, put the focus high from the handball world uh, on his position and on his name. And then I think it's a, it's a great sign to go to the maybe third or fourth team in Germany and say, well, we can build something up here. And he has proven that it's possible. He has proven that uh, you can uh, go there and start to win titles, uh, winning the European League last year and uh, fighting for the title this year as well because uh, the, the race for the championship is super tight. Yeah, it's super tight. It's super tight. Of course, he is a big a big part of this uh, Fuchs Evelin uh, success, we could say. Uh, but of course, Fuchs Evelin has done uh, very good things uh, in this la in these past years, signing also also Lasse Anderson, for example, which right now is one of the key players of the team. Uh, Dejan Milosavljev, which also is a very very a key player for for them. Uh, so, of course, he is a key player who has a big role in this team, but also the rest of the team uh, that is, uh, I don't know if following or joining Matthias Kitzel um, is, is doing a great job, is doing a great job. Yeah, and uh, at this point, we have to say uh, one guy who would have loved to talk to Matthias here uh, isn't joining us right now uh, because we are uh, recording that early in the morning. But as you heard, uh, Matthias uh, needed to, we needed to find a spot where uh, Matthias could arrange it here. Um, and uh, Martin is at work in the morning. That's why he couldn't join us. Um, but yeah, we and are. Because, uh, and because he was scared he's of the who am I of the who am i uh, challenge you know it's yeah. four to two and if it would be five to two that would be something too much for his uh, yeah. confidence i don't think that he's uh, at work right now as well he's sitting at home and studying handball he's uh, going through each and every team of the uh, ehf european league of the champions league of the machine secret ehf champions league of each and every competition just so that he stands a slight chance of beating you next week um when we will record again um But yeah, uh, until then, we can have a little more talks about the Machine Secret Edge of Champions League because uh, last year, uh, last week we spared it out because uh, we had the focus at the Edge of Champions League women. But uh, this week we are uh, coming back to the results because we know the quarterfinalists now. Uh, the second leg of the playoffs of the Machine Secret Edge of Champions League have been played. Um, and I don't think we need to analyze uh, too much of it because... To be fair, no big surprises and all of the games were super clear. 
Yes, I think so. I think so. Uh, one of the players, I thought it would be a little bit more tight. That was Besprem against Seged, but yep. Besprem they they just showed uh, the, their power, which I think they have, and mm-hmm. and in my opinion, they are still the big favorites. Um, this Montpellier Zagreb, uh, it it went as expected. The first the first game in in Zagreb, yep. it was a tight game. And then in in Montpellier, Montpellier won the game with uh, some goals of of difference. And then for me, that that playoff that you saw very tight, that was Georgi Kielce. For me, it was very clear for uh, for Kielce, and yep. and and it was. And Paris Plotsk, it was as well. No uh, no surprise there. I think yep. uh, everybody was expecting Paris to go through, and. And a lot of people is here in Barcelona uh, willing to to say goodbye to Nikola Karabatic uh, in Palau in the game that it might be his last game in this competition. Uh, it might be his could last be. game. It, it could be his last in this competition, but it will for sure be uh, his last game in the competition in Palau Blaugrana. So uh, that will be his farewell from Barcelona, from the Champions League, uh, but from the Machine Secret HF Champions League. Um, but yeah, uh, as we're talking about it, uh, PSG against Barca is the matchup that last year we have seen in the bronze medal match. Many, many, many people predicted it to be the final uh, after having seen the semifinals matchups. But uh, well... One, uh, one of those uh, experts stood stable and said that Magdeburg would win it uh, in the beginning of the Truska 24 uh, EHF Final Four last year. Uh, but I don't remember who it was, but uh, we're not going to uh, come back to that. I'm not the one who's going to uh, brag here. Um, but yeah, uh, it will be the rematch of the bronze medal match uh, last year with the better ending for Barca. And uh, that one will be in coming here once again, question mark? Um I think that at this point, it's many teams who could beat Barcelona in a playoff, but Paris is especially one of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Paris, they have a lot of solutions. They have a lot of uh, players who can have a very good double game and and balance the, you know, and put the balance on the way to, to Paris instead of Barcelona. And and I think that also Raúl González is a coach that will study FC Barcelona uh, game very well, and he will prepare uh, to the minimum detail this this playoff. So I really think it's a very very open quarterfinals uh, this Barcelona Paris. I wouldn't dare to say who is going to win. Of course, my heart is uh, with Barcelona, uh, and who I would have thought. Think <laughs> and I think I think they are slightly favorites, but only slightly. Yeah, yeah, I agree on that. Uh, but uh, we are going to have a closer look on all those matchups uh, when Martin is back, I would say, because we still have a little bit of time left there. I think uh, 25th of April is when the uh, yeah when this round will be starting. So that's in three weeks of no. Oh, Two weeks of time, actually, uh, when we will be looking at the quarterfinals. But until then, I would want to have uh, two statements from you. So, uh, at first, which matchup tickles you the most? And at second, which matchup will be the clearest one? Tickles, you mean which one you're looking, looking at for the, the most? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's this Barcelona Paris. Has for be, yeah. uh, because Barcelona is my club, is my my heart is with them, but also uh, I think it's going to be very special for uh, for uh, Nico to play mm-hmm. against Barcelona, and um, I have a very uh, opposite feelings uh, on this matchup because I want Barcelona to go through because I want them to win this uh, championship. But I also think that it wouldn't be fair for Nico to finish in the quarterfinals of the competition. So yeah. I think this one is the one that I'm looking forward the most. And unlikely, the people might think, I think that the clearest one is going to be Besprem against Olborg. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, looking at the matchups here, I am probably gonna agree on Vesprom Albo being the the clearest here because uh, the ah well no actually I'm gonna go with Montpellier against Kiel. Uh, Kiel is gonna uh, take it home quite securely because uh, well Albo you shouldn't rule them out never. You shouldn't ever rule them out with Nicolas Landin in goal. Uh, you always stand a chance against the biggest teams in the world. Um, where Vesprom can absolutely count them themselves in there even though just finishing third in the group uh, but that's not a shame to do that behind Magdeburg and Barca. Um, I do think that uh, Vesprem will go through but the clearest one will be uh, Kiel against Montpellier. They uh, have to show up in the uh, machine secret of Champions League after I don't want to say throwing away their season because they're still in fourth spot in the Bundesliga, but they need to keep their focus on the Champions League to uh, yeah, basically pull this season into a positive ending. Um, but uh, well, if we're having the rematch of the final, I can't say anything else than uh, the final is, uh, the, uh, well, the, the rematch of the final is tickling me the most with Kielce against uh, Magdeburg. That's a matchup where I'm a little bit torn uh, as well, because as you guys remember, I put all my money on uh, on, uh, on Kielce to, to win this stuff. Uh, Alex Dushabayev becoming uh, becoming the the MVP of the tournament. But on the other hand, uh, Magdeburg uh, they are a team of their very own. So they're a super unique team. I'm super excited to see where this matchup will take us. But we do have a lot of time to have a look into that, and uh, I would say uh, let's analyze and it when it uh, comes down to those matches. I'm gonna go with a prediction. Mm -hmm. It's a very uh, hot one. Oh, go ahead. I think I think it's my opinion. We are gonna have a final four without any German teams. Oh, a final four without any German team. Uh, so, but only talking about the Trust got twenty four EHF final four, not the EHF finals. So, just talking about the Champions League, Machine Secret EHF Champions League. Yes. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, wow, interesting take. I see both German teams going through. So uh, I do think that uh, Magdeburg and Kiel will be there. But we'll see. The time will tell us. Uh, and that's where I would say uh, let's cut it here. It's been a beautiful hour together with the, with Matthias Gitzo, together with you, uh, together with some analysis. Um, the, it's the hot face of the season that is just starting and I couldn't be more excited so uh, thank you Victor thank you for your time here thank you my man and uh, with that I wish you guys a lovely rest of your week and we hear each other again the next time when it's time to talk handball again <laughs> you learned you learned great ball across to Dylan now he double in flight oh what a start yeah. into the net he does it again yes Oh, it's your